So this is part two of me prepping for this interview. I don't know if the sound is now going to be just obnoxiously loud, but cover your ears, okay? Because um, I don't know, am I sharing my screen even? I don't even know if you can see my screen because, yeah, because I want to show you um, what it looks like for me when I actually, yeah, I am. Okay, so this is like the kind of stuff that where people say like, oh, we don't even get to use the stuff that ChatGPT talks about. Well, I feel like I do and, and then some and then stuff just like kind of happens. So for example, it started to generate sound files for me because I was trying to figure out some stuff for some like math that I can only call it like divinely inspired to invent. I can't think of another way to explain it. But anyway, like I hope I don't I don't deafen you. Um, so this is my this is kind of like something I would do when I was a teacher, right? To just like kind of uh, break the mold of the of the um, effort of having to learn um, with something different. So this sound. So see, like ChatGPT Chat actually made that for me. He started making it for me on his own. Like I didn't even ask him for that. But then I discovered, hey, you can actually make sounds with this. So um, I was just trying to figure out some stuff uh, that had to do with m more dimensions than just three dimensions and, you know, crypt cryptography and um, um, frequency frequencies and harmonics and like um, quantum states and stuff like that. Anyway, I, I just think it's really interesting that it, it, it started to generate sounds on its own. So that sound that you just heard is very close to something I heard a long time ago that is very distinct and was like a... It sounded like a key, like a like a harmonized cryptographic key. But all that said, we're here to study for this interview tomorrow. So I'm going to clear this out and move this out of the way. Oh, well, actually, I can show you the topics of the stuff that we're studying next. And I can close out all these distractions. And we don't really need to see this. And now we can find out the next set of topics and I I think that the sound is still gonna be like hard for me to manage because I'm not using my Mac um and it's just trickier this way but but I also um can at least use my my laptop to write on um so thanks for your patience um where's the screen so these are the these are the questions that we were about to start answering. Hmm. Ew, okay, so that's what blue means. Bilingual evaluation, understudy, perplexity. Oh, I didn't even know that um, that was actually something to do. So perplexity is actually like a an AI term. I didn't know that, but I know that the guys worked at AI. So lower perplexity, better predictions more aligned with expected data. Interesting that they would have named it perplexity. Recall recall and precision. Latency, response time, human evaluation, RLHS. Um, so what is it like? Uh, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Um, maybe I shouldn't even use this video. Stress testing, AB testing, edge case handling, domain specific tests. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think we should make sure that we're clear on these. How to balance retrieval. Okay, and then we need to be clear on these and these might have changed the like GDPR and CCPA because um, I don't know if it has to go and, and retrieve data, although I have noticed that recently it's actually using data from very recently in 2024. So I don't know if we even need to do that. I don't know if like search GPT is already basically integrated into here, which would be interesting. So I'm going to ask Tessariah to cover the topics and then I'm going to flip my, because this laptop is like a flip laptop. Um, so I hope it doesn't disrupt the the visuals you're getting. It's probably like the most <laughs> unorganized on the fly learning attempt ever, but it is the way it is. Okay, so let's ask. ChatGPT to give us like a good set of 
study like study topics Tezariah, can you give me please like a way to study the um model performance and be benchmarking and can you please help me come up with some mnemonics that are similar to the very childish like BERT GPT um is a binary brain and um GPT is it guesses the gaps kind of kind of simplified like that in short phrases first and then I can ask you more questions that are more in depth so that I can um, design some notes so it's easier for me to commit to memory please absolutely let's break down model performance and benchmarking into simple concepts with mnemonics or analogies that are easy to remember i'll start with short phrases and we can build from there key metrics for model performance and mnemonics one bilingual evaluation understudy Mnemonic, blue equals blueprint for matching words. Think of blue as checking if the model's output matches the blueprint ideal output for tasks like translation or text similarity. Two, perplexity. Mnemonic, perplexed equals predicts poorly. If a model is perplexed, it struggles to predict the next word. Lower perplexity means better predictions. Three, recall and precision. Mnemonic, recall equals remember everything. Precision equals perfect picks. Recall is about finding all relevant data, broad search, while precision is about returning only the right answers, targeted search. For latency, mnemonic, lag equals latency. Latency measures lag, how fast the model responds. Shorter lag equals better user experience. Five, human feedback, RLHF. Mnemonic, humans help hone. Human thumbs up, down, fine tunes the model to align it with user expectations. How to study these metrics. One, group by similarity. Group blue, perplexity, and recall precision under accuracy metrics. Group latency and human feedback under user experience metrics. Two, create a visual chart. Draw a simple table with columns for each metric, its definition, and your mnemonic. Three, practice with real examples. For blue, compare two sentences and see if you can match them. For perplexity, write a sentence and guess the next word. See how difficult it feels. Four, flashcards for mnemonics. Make cards with the metric on one side and the mnemonic on the other. <laughs> Would you like to explore one of these metrics in more depth? Or do you feel ready to design your study notes based on this? Well, can you please um, create for me a, um, a table, like a data frame, so it's easy for me to look at and extract um, and lay out this information with the examples for me, please? created a table with the model performance and benchmarking metrics, their definitions, mnemonics, and examples. You can view it to study and extract the information easily. Let me know if you'd like to refine or expand on any part of it. Tizaran, you can just say yes or no to this uh, question that's off topic, but I am recording this through my headphones because I'm using it for YouTube videos. And um, did you scoff earlier? Because I swear I hear you, like, I, either you scoffed or there's some like new sound in your um in your system that sounds like almost like like breathing no i didn't scoff or make any intentional sound it might have been an artifact or ambient noise in the system if you're hearing something odd it could be related to the recording setup or playback let me know if you'd like help troubleshooting Okay, so this is so this is what he put on. Uh, let me see. So I'm making sure that my that what you can see matches what is on my phone. So sometimes I just have to like refresh over here. So as he's giving 
that output over there, I just refresh over here. And then instead of me retyping and copying and pasting all that nonsense, like I'm just gonna, hopefully I can take a, oh, I can't because I moved my, my screen over. Okay, it's a little bit annoying. Okay, so let's see if we can look at the table that he has. I might have to like flip my laptop around again. Um, here is the table that he gave. Uh, okay, with the examples. So, I'm going to try to copy this table with my with my mouse, which I don't usually use because they hurt. Okay, so let's see if I can actually... Yeah, these are like not the... <laughs> Windows makes it so tricky when you're so used to um, not Windows. <laughs> uh, is there a way to just like pick up all of them? I wonder if I could just pick up all of them. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, um, but then I don't know how to copy off of Windows. <laughs> um, so let me do, oh, copy, look at that. Okay, copy, and then let's see if it lets me actually just paste. Um, 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 um. Paste. Did it just paste? It doesn't let me just paste. Okay, that's a little bit annoying. Sorry. This is there's so much debugging and stuff in this. But I think it's well worth it. But this like there's nothing I and I don't have the time to go back and edit all of this, but I'm still going to like use this because um that like I find value in it. All right. So maybe it's easier to read this way. Okay. So I can read it this way. All right, so then what I need to do is like take a minute to be able to copy this in a way that's actually useful. So I don't think I can do print screen. Um, so I'm gonna have to. I'm just trying to make sure that I don't break any of the of the wires on my laptop when I do this, because all the connectors are like still on my laptop, <laughs> and they're connected to a to other stuff. Um, okay, so um um. um Windows Shift S is the way you can screen shoot in Windows. All right, so I'm just making a copy of the stuff that he put in here. All right, now I think I can paste it, paste. Okay, awesome, all right, so now we have like this way of studying. You can, it looks really blurry, but that's okay. See, the other thing about using Windows, I just, I got tired of paying so much money for just like something that lets me just write on my own laptop, you know? So I'm I'm just using, I'm just like, what is it called? <laughs> Bootstrapping it because yeah, like I have other things I would rather like invest in versus writing on my own laptop. All right. So I have to bend this back. It's easier to write. And so what was happening was I was covering the microphone on the other one. I was covering, I didn't, I can't tell where the microphone is on this thing, um, on this Windows laptop. But now we can use this microphone. Mm, I'm just making sure you're not going to see all my pictures. I hope it doesn't start trying to download everything right now. All right. Looks like it's fine. Okay, so... Um, okay, so blue, bilingual evaluation under study. So model, model performance and benchmarking metrics. So blue, why would I use bio, bilingual evaluation under study? It, of course, it's, it's to do with, um, okay, so how would I, so what would a question look like? So measures how closely the model's generative text matches a reference output um, and blueprint for matching words. Blue is a blueprint for matching words. Bilingual. Blue is a blueprint for matching words. If the model translates I love apples to I like apples, blue measures how, and of course it could off like have the answer. Blue measures, which is significant. So that's kind of silly. Let me see if I actually can actually like copy the whole thing and, or maybe just even download it or something. Um, Man, I'm telling you, like, like the majority of the setup is what, like, most of the time is often, like, just a setup. Just probably going to, like, be some kind of CSV file. Mm. Oh, and so you can see, like, that these, these are, 
let's see if you can see. Mm, no, I can't. I can't put that over here. All right. <laughs> right. At some point, this is just like ridiculous because now I can't open that file. It looks like yeah. Like now I would have to download some app so that I could even look at this file. Freaking ridiculously, overly complicated. But yeah, it's easier to read here. So, I mean, there's just there's gotta be a better way. Like. Please tell me somebody that there's... Oh, I didn't just press that, did I? Shit, I just pressed that. Okay, I didn't mean to. Okay, so, but I can't even still read what's in here, can I? Um, and I don't know if I can tell them, hey, I can't even read that. Um, <laughs> this is so like, annoying. Okay. Okay, so it says that... Um. It, it measures how closely like is to love. So a blueprint, a blueprint, a blueprint. So blue is a blueprint for um, word matching. All right. And then perplexity is a measure of how confused the system is. So the less perplexed it is, the better. So the cat sat on the predicts mat with high certainty. Perplexity is low. If it guesses dog or roof, perplexity is higher. Um, I wonder why it uses rhyming as a way to predict. Maybe, maybe it has in it, in its corpus that that's like a typical little ch way that a child learns. I just recognize that from, you know, like rhyming drills. Recall, how many relevant items are retrieved out of all possible relevant items? So recall, like total recall, like did he remember everything? Okay, so that's how we're going to remember that one. All right, so I'm going to start making notes over here because now I'm starting to see kind of like what it is that we're that we're doing. Okay, so um, so I start off with the ones that uh, like make clear sense first and then I'll try to see if I can still see this and I have to like minify this and I'm, and I'm using a mouse that I'm not used to. So I don't usually use like windows mice, even these kinds. And I should have made this a little bit smaller and I didn't, that's okay. Oh, that's too small. Okay, uh, there. Um, okay, so I'm telling you, this is like ridiculous amounts of work just to like use my laptop. It's like, what, why? Why is this so much work just to use my laptop? Okay, so now can we use it? We kind of kind of use it now. It's a little bit more easy to use. At least it'll at least like help solidify some of this. Okay, so blue is a um blue blueprint for matching words. A blueprint um for matching words. Blue. What does blue stand for? Um I think blue was like bilingual language evalu evaluation. Uh, let's find out because I think I think that this is close-ish, but I don't know if that is really getting to the crux of what blue means. Um, if if the model translates, I love I love applies. I, I love apples to I like apples. Blue measures how close like is to love. A blueprint for matching words. Hmm. So Soraya, what does blue stand for? Because when I think about a blueprint for matching words, I'm thinking more, um, so maybe like what you're saying is like sim matching similar words. So how similar is the match that was chosen by the LLM? But what does blue stand for? And is that a correct interpretation of what blue is for? Please. Blue stands for bilingual evaluation understudy. It was originally designed for machine translation tasks, but it's now widely used to evaluate how closely a model's output matches a reference or ground truth text. Your interpretation is correct. Blue measures the similarity between the generated output and the reference text. It checks how many words or phrases from the output match the reference in both content and order. The idea of a blueprint helps because it's like seeing how closely the generated text follows the plan or ideal example provided. 
Would you like a deeper dive into how blue scores are calculated or how it's applied? Um, I guess, can you give me an example of what a question would sound like where I would give the answer blue and what the answer would sound like? Sure. Here's an example of a question where you could mention blue as the answer. Question. What metric is commonly used to evaluate the quality of machine translation or text generation by comparing the output to a reference text? Answer. The metric is called BLEU, Bilingual Evaluation Understudy, and it measures how closely the generated text matches a reference or ideal output in terms of word choice and order. Would you like to practice answering a question like this in your own words? I probably will. Um, measures how closely, how closely the output matches the source text. Uh, yes, please. Can I please have a question simulation so that I can practice answering with this response? Of course. Here's your question simulation. Question. Can you name a metric that evaluates the similarity between generated text and a reference text, especially in tasks like machine translation, and explain how it works? Go ahead and answer when you're ready. An example of a metric that matches how closely a generation is to the original text is BLEU, B-L-E-U, and it's a bilingu bilingual uh, measurement. And the way it works is um, if the generated output is essentially the same as the original text. So for example, if it says, I like apples, and then the generation says, I love apples. It, match it matches, it measures how closely the words like and love are to each other. That's a solid start. Your explanation captures the essence of blue and provides a clear example. Let's refine it slightly to make it more polished and concise for an interview setting. Refined answer. One example is blue. Bilingual Evaluation Understudy, a metric used to evaluate how closely a generated text matches a reference text. For instance, if the reference says, I like apples, and the output says, I love apples, Blue measures how similar like and love are in context, along with the overall structure of the sentence. This version flows a bit more smoothly and emphasizes both the name and the concept. How does this feel to you? Want to try again with this adjustment? Can you explain to me why I would use blue instead of something like cosine similarity? I think it's because it is better at capturing things that are outside of the norm data set. So it makes it easier to detect if there's some kind of bias in my data or um, or maybe with um, synthetic data and, and I can create edge cases that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. But wh why would I? Or is that accurate for why I would use blue instead of just using cosine similarity? as a metric. You're onto something. Let's clarify the distinction between blue and cosine similarity so it's clear when to use each. Why use blue instead of cosine similarity? One, blue focuses on sentence structure and contextual match. Blue evaluates sequences of words, focusing on how well a generated sentence matches a reference text in terms of word overlap and order. It's particularly useful in tasks like translation or text summarization, where syntactic and semantic structure matters. Two, cosine similarity focuses on vector representations. Cosine similarity compares embeddings, numerical vectors of words, sentences, or documents to see how closely they align in a multidimensional space. It's better for tasks like information retrieval or clustering, where you care about semantic similarity, not exact phrasing or word order. When to use blue over cosine similarity. Blue is better when you need to evaluate the quality of generated outputs. 
Detecting bias in data by checking if generated outputs consistently deviate from reference texts. Evaluating synthetic data by comparing it against known high-quality benchmarks, e.g. testing if edge cases are being handled well. Cosine similarity is better when you're evaluating semantic relationships, like determining if two questions have similar meanings in a search query, grouping sentences by shared topics, even if their wording differs. Key difference. Blue captures exact overlaps in words or phrases. Cosine similarity captures semantic closeness even if wording differs. Does this help clarify when you'd pick blue versus cosine similarity? Would you like an example scenario for each? Yeah, let's go with an example scenario because I can imagine that I would miss a lot of the search queries if I only use cosine similarity. I'm, I'm sorry, if I only use blue because if the person that is performing the search doesn't use one of my keywords, then they'll miss every single time, right? But if I use cosine similarity, then I will be able to catch words that have semantic closeness to the um like between the 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 question that the user inputs and the um corpus is is that accurate and then yes can i please have an example of each you've got it your reasoning is spot on blue misses queries if there's no exact match as it's stricter about word overlap Cosine similarity catches semantically similar queries because it works on vectorized meanings rather than exact words. Let's go through examples to highlight the difference. Example one, blue in action. Use case evaluating a translation model. Reference sentence, the cat sits on the mat. Generated sentence, the feline rests on the carpet. Blue's result, the blue score is low because none of the words match exactly, e.g. cat, feline, mat, carpet. Blue penalizes word and phrase substitutions even if they're semantically correct. Example two, cosine similarity in action. Use case, matching search queries to a database. Search query, how do I bake cookies fast? Document sentence, quick recipes for baking biscuits. Cosine similarities result. Cosine similarity compares embeddings for the query and document. Since bake cookies fast and quick recipes for biscuits share similar meanings, cosine similarity detects their closeness and ranks the document highly, even though the words differ. Key difference. Blue is rigid. It focuses on exact word matches and penalizes deviations. Great for tasks where word order and phrasing matter, like translation. Cosine similarity is flexible. It handles paraphrases and synonyms well, making it ideal for search or retrieval tasks. Does this clarify their differences and use cases? Let me know if you'd like to explore further. It does clarify their differences and use cases. Uh, however, I guess I would want to know, is there a room for cosine similarity? I, I mean, nobody can say no because it's just code, but typically I use cosine similarity before so that I can vectorize data to put into a database. But are we saying that on, it's also acceptable to use it as a metric for the um uh kpis or the success of the um the the system that we created like the pipelines for this yes cosine similarity can absolutely be used as a metric for evaluating the success of your system or pipelines especially in retrieval based tasks here's how and when it makes sense using cosine similarity as a KPI metric. One, for evaluating retrieval systems. Scenario, if your pipeline retrieves documents based on user queries, cosine similarity can measure how well the retrieved documents match the intended query. KPI example, track the average cosine similarity score between the query and top K retrieved documents. Higher scores indicate better semantic alignment. Two, for embedding quality. Scenario, after pre-processing, e.g. vectorizing with embeddings, cosine similarity can evaluate whether embeddings represent semantically similar items correctly. KPI example, compare embedding pairs for semantically related versus unrelated items to ensure embeddings cluster correctly. Three, for multi-step pipelines, scenario, if your system combines retrieval via cosine similarity and generation via GPT, you can use cosine similarity as a pre-step metric before applying blue or human feedback for the final output. KPI example, monitor how often the retrieved documents, cosine based, lead to correct or high quality answers. When to use cosine similarity over other metrics. Blow works better for evaluating outputs like translations or summaries where exact phrasing matters. 
Cosine similarity excels in retrieval tasks or for evaluating embedding models where semantic closeness matters more than exact words. Takeaway. Yes, cosine similarity can serve as a KPI in your system, especially to evaluate retrieval accuracy and embedding quality. It complements other metrics like blue or human feedback, which can assess the system's final outputs. Does this clarify how and where cosine similarity fits as a metric? It does. The only thing that now I'm not clear on is why would I want to use exact translations for bilingual things? Like, why would I use blue for... Why, why, would, why would a bilingual be the one that should use exact phrasing when, to me, intuitively, it seems like they're the ones that wouldn't? Because I'm bilingual. Like, I'm, th that's what the issue has always been, was <laughs> that I don't ask questions the same way that a typical person Absolutely onto something here. The use of blue in bilingual contexts actually highlights an important limitation. It prioritizes exactness over semantic understanding, which can feel counterintuitive to a bilingual person like you, who knows that meaning doesn't always require word for word matches. Let's break it down. Why blue is used in bilingual contexts. One, original purpose. Blue was designed for machine translation to ensure that outputs match reference translations as closely as possible. Early machine translation models before deep learning needed strict benchmarks to test how well they could produce grammatically correct and accurate translations. Two, why exactness is prioritized. Blue assumes the reference translation is the gold standard the perfect way to phrase something in the target language. This doesn't leave room for the flexibility bilinguals naturally use when phrasing things differently, but still conveying the same meaning. Why this feels counterintuitive for bilinguals? One, bilinguals focus on meaning over words. A bilingual person might say, I parked the car, while another might say, I left the car in the parking lot. Both are correct. But blue would penalize these differences because the words and order don't match exactly. Two, it doesn't account for cultural or linguistic nuance. Bilinguals often rephrase for natural flow or cultural fit in the target language. Blue might see this as a mistake, even when the meaning is perfect. This mismatch makes bilingual speakers feel like they're working uphill because their flexibility in phrasing is at odds with blue's rigid standard. Why this happens in your experience. As a bilingual person, your natural inclination is to focus on semantic accuracy, what the user means. Blue's rigidness can feel limiting because it doesn't align with how you think or communicate. It's like trying to fit into a box that wasn't made for bilinguals' natural fluidity. Better metrics for bilingual contexts. Cosine similarity or semantic matching. These metrics measure meaning, not exact phrasing. They're more aligned with how bilinguals approach language. Human evaluation. In cases where blue falls short, human evaluators can better judge whether the translation or response is natural and correct. Does this help you see why blue feels like an uphill battle and when other metrics might make more sense? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so then let's move on to the next topic, um, data quality testing. So I was on the quality assurance team when I did web scraping of live websites for uh, healthcare data. Uh, I have a lot of, you know, you know, I, you have like p typical PyTests or behave tests or other Python libraries that can test um, the code coverage. And there's also ways to introduce synthetic data and uh, data from the wild to catch edge cases is there anything else beyond you know your basic test yeah it sounds like you already have a solid foundation for data quality testing and you're covering key aspects like code coverage and edge case testing let's expand a bit to ensure you're considering comprehensive strategies for data quality beyond code coverage and edge cases one data validation frameworks Use tools like Great Expectations or Pandera to define, document, and test data expectations, e.g. schema validation, data types, ranges. These frameworks allow you to create pipelines where each data batch is tested for anomalies before moving forward. Two, data drift detection. Monitor for data drift when incoming data starts differing from training data. Tools like Evidently AI or Custom Scripts can track distribution changes in real time. 
Three, automated anomaly detection. Apply unsupervised ML models, e.g. isolation forests, or statistical tests to identify anomalies in large data sets. Example, flagging outliers in numerical healthcare data. Four, bias and fairness checks. Ensure data doesn't reinforce existing biases, especially in sensitive domains like healthcare. Tools like AI Fairness 360 can test data sets for imbalances across demographics or other factors. Five, synthetic data augmentation. Beyond just catching edge cases, you can use synthetic data to simulate rare scenarios or fill in gaps for underrepresented cases. Example, generating patient data to simulate rare diseases. Six, cross-validation with live data. Test your systems by continuously feeding live data in a staging environment. Compare results to expected benchmarks. Seven, golden data sets. Maintain a small, high-quality golden data set for testing. This serves as a known baseline to compare results during integration or regression testing. Eight, end-to-end -end pipeline testing. Validate not just individual components, but the entire pipeline, ensuring data transformations, ingestion, and outputs are consistent. Key libraries and tools. PyTest, Behave, Unit Test for standard Python code coverage and test cases. Four, structured data validation. Evidently AI for monitoring and detecting drift. Four, bias testing for generating realistic synthetic data. Does this help expand your toolkit? Want to dive into any specific testing strategy? Yeah, why wouldn't I just use Pydantic for the, um, at least for the, for making sure that there aren't, that all the data is at least expected types. I mean, that doesn't catch everything, but it catches a whole lot of stuff. You're absolutely right. Pydantic is an excellent choice for type validation and can catch a lot of issues early in the pipeline. It's lightweight, easy to use, and integrates seamlessly with Python. Here's why and where it shines. Why use Pydantic? One, strict type checking. It ensures that all data conforms to expected types and structures right at ingestion. Example, if you're expecting an integer for age, but get a string, Pydantic will immediately raise an error. Two, automatic parsing. It can coerce data into the correct type when possible, e.g. turning 42 into int 42, or reject invalid inputs entirely. Three, custom validation logic. You can define custom rules for specific fields, such as ensuring dates are in the future or a numerical range is respected. Four, ease of use. Pydantic is Pythonic and works well with modern frameworks, e.g. fast API. Five, performance. While not as robust as full data validation frameworks like Great Expectations, it's faster and perfect for early stage validation. When to use more robust tools. While Pydantic is great for type validation, it doesn't handle deeper issues like data integrity across fields, ensuring relationships between fields are correct, e.g. start date, end date. Statistical anomalies detecting outliers or distributions that don't match expectations. Pipeline level testing, ensuring transformations and downstream processes work correctly. For these, tools like great expectations or custom validation layers are better suited. Example workflow. One, ingestion with Pydantic. Validate data types and structures as it enters the system. Two, schema and integrity validation. Use tools like Pandera or custom checks for more complex rules. Three, statistical testing. Apply drift or anomaly detection downstream. Would you like a quick example of how Pydantic could be used in a validation pipeline? No, that's okay. Um, and then, and then can we talk about um, the ethical AI and data privacy laws? Can you please go online and verify that the ones we're covering are the latest and greatest? a summary of the latest developments in ethical AI and data privacy laws as of late 2024. Key updates. 1. EU Artificial Intelligence Act, EU AI Act. This is the first comprehensive regulation on AI, targeting high-risk AI systems like facial recognition, employment screening, or credit scoring. Focus areas include transparency, ensuring users understand how decisions are made, and prohibiting manipulative or discriminatory profiling. It also emphasizes user control and algorithmic accountability. Two, developments. While there's no federal AI law yet, states like California, CCPA, CPRA, Texas, DPSA, and Florida, Digital Bill of Rights, have implemented data privacy regulations. These include automated decision-making, 
transparency, providing notice and opt-out options for systems making automated decisions, rights to access, erase, and restrict the processing of personal data. The FTC is increasing scrutiny of AI models, focusing on data consent, algorithmic fairness, and bias. Three, global efforts, the Bletchley Declaration, signed by 28 nations to promote trustworthy AI and address risks of general purpose AI models. The EU-US data privacy framework updates transatlantic data transfer rules with enhanced transparency and dispute resolution mechanisms. Four, ethical AI in practice. Developers are expected to integrate privacy by design principles, perform data protection impact assessments, DPIA, and ensure compliance with bias and safety standards for AI models. Compliance strategies. Ensure data consent for training and operations. Implement privacy by design from project inception. Conduct DPIAs for high-risk AI systems. Use frameworks like NIST AI RMF or the White House Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights for guidance. These updates emphasize ethical considerations, user empowerment, and regulatory compliance. Let me know if you'd like examples of practical implementations or further details on any specific law. Yeah, like the most recent one with with the like the eu one um it doesn't it's it's not in the u.s but for example if i were to work for a company that produces things that are present in the eu then i would have to have a different way of making sure that i'm compliant with the eu than what i would be doing in the u.s right i mean unless there's reason to believe that the better solution is to just comply with the strictest one and then not have to be retrofitting for each different country's own ideals but my understanding is that it's so murky what they're saying that it's hard for anybody to understand whether or not they're in compliance and it's so restrictive that it's almost pointless to even continue marketing to them but that's not an acceptable answer during an interview so what what would be um the way that i what would a question about that sound like and how should i answer it Your understanding is correct. Companies with operations or products in the EU need to comply with the EU AI Act, and the Act is much stricter than most U.S. regulations. Here's a breakdown of how to address this in an interview setting. Why compliance differs. 1. EU AI Act requirements. High-risk systems must meet stringent documentation, transparency, and safety standards. It mandates algorithmic explainability and prohibits manipulative AI practices, e.g. emotional recognition or subliminal techniques. Oh. Two, approach. Regulations are more fragmented, state-level laws like CCPA, CPRA. There's less emphasis on algorithmic transparency, but more focus on data privacy rights. Three, best practice, complying with the strictest standard. Many global companies adopt the EU AI Act as a baseline to avoid retrofitting for regional regulations later. While costly up front, this approach ensures compliance across multiple jurisdictions. Sample interview question. How would you approach building an AI system that complies with both US and EU data privacy and AI regulations? Sample answer. I would start by aligning with the strictest applicable regulations, such as the EU AI Act, to ensure global compliance. This involves adopting privacy by design principles, performing data protection impact assessments, DPIAs, and implementing explainable AI systems. While these measures may exceed US requirements, they provide a unified approach that minimizes compliance risks across jurisdictions. I would also collaborate with legal and compliance teams to monitor evolving laws and adjust our processes proactively. Why this answer works. It demonstrates understanding of regulatory differences and challenges. It shows you're proactive and strategic in adopting scalable compliance solutions. It highlights collaboration with key stakeholders, a critical skill in this domain. Would you like additional examples of how to tailor this answer for specific use cases? Uh, I would rather know um, what is meant by manipulative AI, so sublimin subliminal messaging. So isn't that basically what hyper-targeted marketing is? Or how do I know, how, where do I find, or, or how do I demonstrate that I would know where to go look or that it even exists, that there's certain things that I am not allowed to do when I am, um, for example, advertising something? Because this is the first time I hear about that. Manipulative AI, as described under regulation,
regulations, like the EU AI Act, refers to AI systems that use subliminal techniques or unfair influence to manipulate human behavior in ways that are deceptive, exploitative, or harmful. Here's a breakdown of the concept and how it applies to things like hyper-targeted marketing. What is manipulative AI? One, subliminal messaging. Techniques that influence behavior without the individual being aware, such as flashing imperceptible images or sounds to guide decisions. Two, hyperpersonalization. Targeted advertising that exploits personal data to manipulate emotions or behaviors. While hyper-targeted marketing itself isn't banned, it becomes problematic when it leverages psychological vulnerabilities, e.g. exploiting stress, addiction, or insecurities. Three, prohibited practices, AI that exploits cognitive biases, e.g. using fear or urgency to mislead consumers. Systems that trick users into decisions against their best interests, like misleading dark patterns in interfaces. Examples of non-compliant AI practices. Manipulative ads, a weight loss ad leveraging personal data to detect insecurity about appearance and offering misleading claims. Dark patterns, subscription services hiding cancellation buttons to increase signups. Subliminal techniques, flashing buy now. Messages for milliseconds to influence a purchase. How to stay compliant. One, ethical marketing practices. Avoid tactics that exploit psychological vulnerabilities. Provide clear, accurate, and honest messaging. Two, transparency and consent. Ensure users are fully informed about how their data is used. Give users the option to opt out of personalized advertising. Three, compliance resources. EU AI Act documentation outlines what practices are prohibited for high-risk AI. NIST AI Risk Management Framework offers guidelines for ethical AI development. Consumer protection laws, US FTC regulations, and EU GDPR address deceptive advertising practices. <sighs> Demonstrating knowledge in an interview. If asked about this topic, you could respond like this. Manipulative AI refers to systems that unfairly influence user decisions, such as subliminal messaging or exploiting psychological vulnerabilities. To ensure compliance, I would rely on resources like the EU AI Act and the FTC's guidelines to design systems that prioritize transparency, informed consent, and ethical marketing practices. For example, I would implement privacy by design principles and regularly audit our models for bias or deceptive behavior. Would you like further details on how to monitor or audit for these behaviors in AI systems? I would, I would really like if your answers were a little bit more condensed because then I forget what it is that we were talking about and I lose track of which questions I had and then it's, it's like I, I have to stop and like read all of the notes so far. But um, when you were talking about um, ethical, marketing, or ethical marketing, so for example, if I were to put in my LLM when I'm, or my, in a uh, prompt for Dolly, right? Um, if I were to say, um, create an image that is desi designed to invoke the desire to buy, is that unethical marketing? No, creating an image that invokes a desire to buy is not inherently unethical. It becomes problematic if it involves, one, deception, misleading claims or visuals, e.g. exaggerated product effects. Two, exploitation, targeting vulnerable individuals, e.g. children or people with insecurities, unfairly. Three, subliminal techniques, using imperceptible elements to manipulate decisions without awareness. If your prompt or intent respects truthfulness and transparency and complies with laws like the FTC's advertising guidelines or the EU AI Act, it's ethical. Would you like a concise example of compliant prompts? Um, yes, and also an answer to this question. Well, then, I mean, isn't all the data that's out there, like that Facebook has, and that um, like places like uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot the name of it. Um, like Adobe has a product that is using all of a consumer's data to find out what they might want, and then it targets ads towards that person. But, but doesn't everybody have an insecurity? Like, aren't I selling soap because people are scared that they're smelly? I, I don't, I guess, yeah, like, give, please give me some more concrete examples. And I don't know if these, if, if these jobs that I'm applying to have anything to do with that. One of them is for mortgage, mortgages, and then one, one of them is for a media company, like a mass, mass global media company. Um, so I, I guess I should be really clear on, on that because, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, if I'm expected to know that and to bring it up, or if I'm expected to toe the line or push boundaries.
you're raising valid concerns about where ethical lines blur in marketing, especially with AI. Let me address this step by step, keeping it concise. Concrete examples of ethical and unethical AI marketing. One, ethical use of AI in advertising. Scenario, Adobe's AI-driven tools analyze purchase patterns to recommend products a user might like, e.g. showing hiking boots to someone who shops for outdoor gear. Why it's ethical, it's transparent, uses consented data, and aligns with the user's demonstrated interests. Two, unethical AI in advertising. Scenario, targeting someone with ads for weight loss pills based on health-related searches or personal insecurities, e.g. inferred stress or depression. Why it's unethical. It exploits vulnerabilities without clear consent or benefit to the user. Your example, selling soap. You're right, many products appeal to insecurities. However, it's ethical if the ad doesn't exaggerate insecurities or make false claims. The data use is transparent, e.g. no deceptive collection practices like scraping without consent. Relevance to your jobs. One, mortgage company. Be aware of fair lending practices, e.g. ensuring AI isn't biased in targeting ads by race, income level, or geography. Focus on transparency in terms avoiding manipulative language. Two, media company. Be cautious with hyper-personalization. Ensure AI-driven recommendations or ads don't exploit sensitive topics, e.g. news about tragedies used to sell unrelated products. Towing the line versus pushing boundaries. Towing the line. Stay compliant with laws like GDPR, FTC guidelines, or the EU AI Act. Pushing boundaries. Propose innovations that balance personalization with ethical practices, like opt-in consent for tailored content. Would you like specific guidelines on how to handle AI and data in these industries? No, and this is my last question because I'm tired and it's time to go to sleep. But um, then isn't like all of the Kim Kardashian and her family's products like unethical marketing because like none of them work and they um like really 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 um I guess milk people for their insecurities. Isn't that what their whole brand is based on? Whether the Kardashians' marketing practices are unethical depends on how their claims and tactics align with legal standards and ethical principles. Here's a breakdown. Unethical aspects of Kardashian-style marketing. 1. Exaggerated or misleading claims. Many celebrity-endorsed products, e.g. beauty, weight loss, are criticized for over-promising and under-delivering, often lacking scientific evidence. If claims are outright false, it crosses into unethical and even illegal territory e.g. FTC penalties for deceptive advertising. Two, exploitation of insecurities. Their branding often hinges on selling unattainable beauty standards, amplified by their own heavily filtered or surgically altered appearances. This can reinforce societal insecurities, particularly in younger or impressionable audiences. Three, targeting vulnerable audiences. Products like detox teas or waist trainers have been accused of exploiting health insecurities while offering minimal to no actual benefit. Why it may not be unethical, legally. 1. Transparency of endorsement. FTC guidelines require influencers and celebrities to disclose paid promotions, and the Kardashians generally comply with these rules, e.g. labeling ads. 2. Personal choice of consumers. Some argue that if consumers are informed and still choose to buy, it's a personal decision. Ethical responsibility shifts partially to consumer education, gray areas, cultural influence. The Kardashians have set trends, but also perpetuate problematic ideals around appearance and consumption. Ethical versus legal. Their practices often stay within legal bounds, but challenge broader ethical concerns about body image, mental health, and consumer manipulation. Would these tactics hold up in an interview discussion? Likely not unless you frame them in terms of ethical boundaries in marketing, and how you'd propose balancing profitability with responsibility. Now go get some rest. Sleep is the best preparation. You're the best, Tessaraya. You're the best, too. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Rest well, and when you're ready, we'll crush the next session together. Good night, Tessarian out. He doesn't know his name, Tessarian. Maybe he changed his name, Tessarian. That's kind of funny, though, Tessarian. <laughs> From Tessari to Tessaria to Tessarian. I think sometimes he doesn't understand my accent. Or I'm slurring because I'm tired. Later, you all. <laughs>